Biological classification, also known as phylogenetics, is the process of grouping species together according to their evolutionary history. Phylogenetics utilizes all kinds of data, ranging from anatomical and physiologic data to genetic information, to help understand the evolutionary past of species and then classify them according to those relationships. In this video, we'll talk about phylogenetics and a subgroup of that known as cladistics and the types of evidence and how that evidence is used to classify organisms. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Any conversation about biological classification or phylogenetics has to start with Carl Linnaeus. So Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist and zoologist who lived during the 18th century. And one of the things that frustrated Linnaeus was the fact that there were so many different names for individual species. Uh, he lived in a world that there was no way of actually naming individual species. Uh, and quite often what would happen is an individual species would have dozens of different names. Uh, and a lot of it depended on which country the person who was uh, identifying the species came from, so which what their native language was. So what Carl first proposed was actually a the, the, the first modern taxonomic system for naming species. And under his particular system, each species would be given a two-part Latin name. Uh, the first would be known as the generic name, also known as the genus, and the second would be its specific epithet, also known as the species. So the two-part Latin name that all species have nowadays, uh, we owe to Carl Linnaeus, uh, and it's the genus and the species written in Latin. Now, moving on, afterwards, Carl Linnaeus, as well as many of his contemporaries, went on to deploy this system and sort of give true scientific names that would be united across all fields uh, so that everybody knew what exactly what species was being spoken about. Uh, they went through existing species and also gave scientific names to newly discovered species. Now, what's interesting is they would also lump together species uh, based on the similarities that they had so that they would be together in the same genus. Uh, what was particularly interesting then is all of this is happening in the 18th century almost a, a full century prior to when Darwin would publish uh, on the origin of species and provide our modern understanding of Darwinistic evolution. So what's actually happening is these individuals are going around grouping species together, but not having any concept that what they're actually doing is trying to lump things together based on their evolutionary relatedness. There was no tie-in for that. What's really interesting, however, is that when individuals went back and kind of checked the groupings that Linnaeus and his contemporaries uh, you know, made based on their two-part Latin names, uh, they were actually remarkably accurate uh, at lumping together species that were evolutionary, ev closely evolutionarily related to each other. Uh, I mean, they weren't perfect, but they were, they were pretty accurate given that they had no understanding of evolutionary relationships. And the reason for this is kind of simple. It's because living things form naturally call naturally these things called nested hierarchies. And this is due to the fact that species are interrelated. What that means is species naturally have certain similarities and dissimilarities. And the reason for those similarities in many cases is the fact that they are evolutionarily related. These are things like homologous structures. And when modern phylogenists started to go out and, uh, and actually look at individual species to reclassify these or to classify new ones, what they really focus on are these homologous structures. They're looking for physical characteristics, anatomical characteristics, physiologic characteristics, and nowadays genetic characteristics that these species have in common. With the concept of trying to form phylogenetic trees, which are nothing more than proposed hypothetical relationships between species. And I must stress that these relationships are hypothetical. As with everything in science, taxonomy or phylogenetics is a scientific endeavor. And we, what we do is all of these phylogenetic trees that you see, later we'll see some cladograms uh, when we get there. These are all hypotheses that can be tested by looking for various data. Uh, and they are formed through the collection of data. But the thing about them is this, these are our best understanding given the data that we have. Phylogenetic relationships can and have changed over time once we have new information. 
But the bottom line is if you are a taxonomist or if you are a phylogeneticist, what you're trying to do is use all of the data available and you're trying to establish phylogenetic trees using something known as maximum parsimony. So when we look to explore the relationship between species, we try to use the most parsimonious relationship to help explain them. Here's what I mean by maximum parsimony or most parsimonious. The most parsimonious explanation for similarities between species or relationship between species is the one that involves the least amount of evolutionary change. So maybe I can best explain this by, by using an example. This is essentially the biological concept of Occam's razor, which if you're not familiar with that basically states that the simplest explanation is most likely the correct one. So let's take an example. Let's say you look at a snake and an earthworm. So if you look at a snake and an earthworm, superficially, they have a lot of similarities with each other. They're long, tubular-shaped species. They completely, lack, they completely lack legs. They live on the ground or in holes underground. That's a lot of things that they have in common. But when you actually look at the entirety of the data, when you start looking and you notice, for example, that the snake is a vertebrate, whereas the earthworm is an invertebrate, the snake has lungs, whereas the earthworm breathes through, through these sort of tracheal tubes. Um, that, that, the, that there's a, that there's a bone structures within, within the, within the snake where there are no bones in the earthworm, that the snake lays an amniotic egg, whereas the earthworm does not do any of those things. The bottom line is this, there are far more dissimilarities between snakes than there in earthworms than there are similarities. And in fact, the majority of the similarities are completely superficial. And I know this seems silly, but I'm trying to use an easy example for this. It's much more likely, it's much more parsimonious then to assign snakes to belong to the group of reptiles, which also have amniotic eggs and also have vertebrae and also have bones. Um, and just and state that it's quite simple that snakes are nothing more than reptiles that have lost their legs through reductive evolution and earthworms belong to a completely other separated group of segmented worms known as the annelids. That's the most parsimonious relationship. Here's another great example. When we look at cetaceans, which are whales, dolphins, and and orcas. If you look at them, they superficially look like fish. So they live underwater. They have very hydrodynamic dynamic body plans. They don't have hind limbs and so on. They have flippers. But when you actually look at the entirety of the data, it's very clear that cetaceans are in fact not fish. And there's lots of reasons why. Cetaceans don't have, lung, don't have gills. They have lungs. They don't breathe underwater. They must come up to breathe for air. When you look at their flippers, they're not the, fl the flippers of ray-finned fish. They're not the flippers of cartilaginous, cartilaginous fish like sharks. No, they actually have the same body plan that we find in modern-day tetrapods. They've simply just lost their hind limbs. Even their tails are actually horizontally oriented versus being vertically oriented in fish. All of these, and in fact, here's another thing. They also have fur on their blowhole. They give birth to live young, which they nurse with their, with their mother's milk. The bottom line is this, it's quite clear that whether you're a whale or you're a dolphin or you're an orca, you're not a fish, you're a mammal, just like everything else that gives birth to live young and nurses it with mother's milk and has at least some amount of hair or fur. So in reality, what we're looking at when we do these relationships, when we examine these relationships is we're looking for the most parsimonious explanation for these events. This most parsimonious relationship is going to always come in the form of looking at the data. It's looking at the anatomical data and the physiologic data. And this is traditionally how it was done up until about 20 or 30 years ago. Then the advent of, uh, of, of rapid, high throughput, cost-effective, efficient gene sequencing opened up a whole new avenue of, of phylogenetic research. And now we also have a whole host of genomic data that can be useful in classifying species. Just like we assume with physical characteristics, the least amount of change is the most likely to explain a very close relationship between species. We're essentially looking for homologous structures just in the form of genes. And what's really nice is now that we have a lot of that genomic data uh, available to us, one of the things we see first and foremost is that a lot of the relationships that were the hypothetical relationships that were proposed based on just anatomical, physiologic, behavioral data are actually agreed upon by the genetic data. So it serves as further confirmation of those hypotheses. In other cases, genetic data has actually provided clarity where there wasn't clarity. So for example, 
Quite often, and I know it seems silly, but it's true, and there are often heated debates at conferences about the actual evolutionary relationships between species. Are they each other's common ancestor? Is one actually a descendant of another? How are they related? Well, genetic data has actually helped to settle some of those arguments by providing clear evidence of, of, of one type of relationship over another. The other thing that happens rarely, but it does happen, is that the genetic data actually flips what we believed on its head. Uh, so uh, sometimes we get the genetic data and we see that there is way more similarity between two species we once thought were distantly related based on their physical characteristics, or that we find two species that are very, very similar in structure are actually quite distantly related from each other evolutionarily in what we thought were homologies. What we thought were homologous structures were actually analogous structures and the result of convergent evolution. Either way, that's really cool. Now, you can get a bit of information overload. So if you have uh, you know, physical and anatomical data that says one thing and you have genetic data that says another, which one do you go with? And then you're right back into that circle of people yelling at each other at scientific conferences about whether these things are closely related or distantly related, whether it's a homologous structure or an analogous structure or so on and so forth. But that's what science is actually about. Now, again, the reason why classification works at all, the reason why phylogenetics works at all, is because of these natural nested hierarchies. These homologies that we see in species are the result of shared ancestry. And, you know, it's one of those things where uh, the reason why Linnaeus and his contemporaries got so many things right was they were looking at homologies without knowing what they were. And in some cases, they were wrong. They would find things that they thought were homologous that are actually analogous uh, and therefore, you know, weren't actually the result of shared ancestry. What's really cool is nested hierarchies in and of themselves provide evidence of evolution. And if you don't believe me, you can kind of prove it to yourself. Artificially created things don't exhibit nested hierarchies. Only naturally created things do. Only living things actually do. And you can actually test this among your friends. Uh, here's a little experiment you can actually do to prove this to yourself. Take, you know, 10, 15 animals and make a list of them and then give them to your friends and say, hey, look, I want you to classify these. I have to make a phylogenetic tree. Hopefully they remember how to do it from science class at some point and say, look, lump these together by the ones that you think are the most closely related and, and then separate them from the ones you think are most, most, most distantly related. Then give them a list of like, you know, 10 or 15 candy bars and have them do the exact same thing. Each individual should be able to do this, but here's what's going to be very interesting. When you look at the phylogenetic trees that your friends produce from animals, they're probably going to be, and I can guarantee they're going to be very, very, very similar. And the reason why is they're going to be looking at objective data. They're going to be looking at things that are inherently true that you really can't see any other way. Oh, all these things that have fur and mammary glands and give birth to live young and nurse that young, you know, they belong together. And all these things that have bones definitely belong to the things that have bones versus the things that don't have bones uh, and so on and so forth. But when you look at the candy bar lists, first off, they're going to be super cool to see what your friends think about the classification of candy bars. But the lists are very, they're going to be a mess. They're going to be completely different. And the reason why is things like candy bars or toys or, or, or sports cars, they don't exhibit nested hierarchies. They're completely artificial because each and every one is made from scratch. Sure, they may have some shared components, but they're arranged differently and placed differently and they're artificially created. So the fact that nested hierarchies actually exist is evidence in and of itself of the evolutionary relatedness of species because we see things that don't have an evolutionary path actually don't exhibit these nested hierarchies. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is a more modern field uh, of phylogeny known as cladistics. And there is an ongoing debate whether cladistics is a sub-discipline of, of phylogenetics or whether it represents its own branch of, of biological classification. For what it's worth, I, I'm I'm on I'm on the former. I think it's just you know a, a sub discipline of, of phylogenetics. But nevertheless, uh, I'd hear a good argument from the other side if somebody wanted to present me with one. You know, it's not really important where you think it falls in. But the bottom line is, cladistics looks to use uh, both physical and genetic data to determine the exact evolutionary relationships of species. Okay, and they do this by forming certain things called clades and then building things called cladograms. So a cladogram is just a specific form of, uh, of a phylogenetic tree. Okay, um, clades, when we talk about clades, uh, this is a cladistics definition. And a clade is actually uh, a single common ancestor in all of its descendants. So for something to be a good clade, you actually have to include the common ancestor and then everything that's descended from it for it to be considered to be a clade. This is where you may hear the term monophyletic group. 
as opposed to a polyphyletic group. A monophyletic group means that all every individual within that group comes from a single common ancestor or is believed to come from a single common ancestor. A polyphyletic group, it means they come from different ancestors. You may hear that term in, in, in some of your biology classes moving forward. That's where it comes from. It's a cladistics term. Now, when we talk about cladistics, what we're looking at are ancestral traits and then shared derived traits, also known as ancestral characteristics and shared derived characteristics. And this is sort of how we set up clades. So shared derived traits or shared derived characteristics are those that are derived by a group from a single common ancestor. So in other words, that common ancestor, that's sort of the root of this, of this clade, I don't think that's the right term or not, but the, the base of this clade, that particular trait is found in that particular species. And as a result, all of the descendants of that species possess that trait. And that's how cladograms are actually built. Uh, a shared ancestral trait then is one that the common ancestor and all members of that group have, but other clades have as well. It means it's something that was around before this clade sort of differentiated itself or diverged from, uh, you know, from, the, from a fi another uh, phylogenetic tree, essentially. All right. So uh, before we go, I just want to go over a few things because uh, cladograms often show up uh, in places like exams uh, or they get talked about in other classes that you may be taking or you may just want to know what a cladogram actually is. Uh, cladograms are uh, a bit unique in terms of phylogenetic trees. So uh, they kind of look like this um, and there are kind of some parts that you need to do that, that you need to recognize. So usually where the line starts is known as a root. Um, you can have unrooted uh, cladograms. Um, not a big deal either way, but the root is typically that common ancestor of that whole group, which may or may not represent a clade. Um, then as you go up that file uh, of that cladogram, what you'll see are different branch points. So branch points, so that central line that goes up the middle, that's sort of the through lineage. That's sort of the in group. It's what we're talking about, right? That's the main lineage we're describing. And again, that's all a matter of perspective. Um, you can actually draw a cladogram from any perspective where any one of those is the main root uh, or, or the, the, the main line, the main through line for that particular cladogram. It's not a big deal. Uh, but if you look at a cladogram, you've got this main lineage and then everything branches off of that. Then sometimes what you see when you get to a branch point, those branch points are typically distinguished by some type of shared derived trait that one group has and another one doesn't. So quite often it's labeled on the cladogram. Here's the thing that makes this particular group leave the lineage. They don't possess it, whereas everything beyond this point does possess that trait. Okay, that's a shared derived characteristic of all of these things past this point this group of species doesn't have it, which means they left that lineage prior to the evolution of that trait. Then you go up and you hit the next branch point. Sometimes branch points have multiple lines that come off of it. So you end up with what's known either as sister taxa, if it's two, or you end up with a polytomy if there are several different ones. Uh, what this means is there is sort of an undescribed relationship there. So uh, that branch point represents a common ancestor but it's unclear uh, how those species that come off of that branch point are related to the common ancestor. Um, the way it's drawn, it's typically assumed that they are considered to be equally related. Um, typically it means there's just not enough evidence to figure out one way or the other where they both diverge from that common ancestor or whether one diverge later on than another one. Um, usually means you need more evidence to, to sort of suss that relationship out, but it's not a big deal. Remember, cladograms, just like all phylogenetic trees, are hypothetical. So there is an allowance for new data and for these cladograms to change as new data becomes available. You may also see things listed as basal taxa. That usually means something that came off very early on uh, in the history of these groups of species. So if you hear something is being referred to as the most basal uh, of this, so I think I talked about it in another video. We talked about lemurs being the most basal uh, primates, they were like the first to sort of leave the main lineage of primates, which hung around in Africa. That's likely because they actually got on the boat to Madagascar uh, and hung out in Madagascar all by themselves for the past 50 million years or so, which explains why they look so entirely different from the remainder of the primate species uh, that exist on the planet Earth. Now, again, like I said, uh, when it comes to cladograms, um, we're using shared derived and shared ancestral traits. Uh, to sort of distinguish between species and describe the relationships. Big thing to remember is that um, cladograms are, I guess, uh, they're a matter of perspective. It's about what you're talking about. So um, you can draw them from any perspective. We could redraw this particular cladogram right now to look completely different, and it wouldn't matter. It's going to convey the same information. It's just all about how you want to present the data.
The bottom line is this, when it comes to taxonomy, whether you're using a cladistics approach, whether you're using uh, you know, standard phylogenetic approaches, what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish and understand the evolutionary relationships between various species. Now, is that always clear and evident? No, it's not. Sometimes it's very hard to distinguish these things. And that's why we always refer to phylogenetic trees as hypotheses. Because like all hypotheses, phylogenetic trees are always looking for more data to either support that hypothesis or to, uh, to alter what we know about these particular species relationships and change it. Just like we saw with the, with, with, with the increase in genetic data that taught us a lot about our existing phylogenetic trees. Some changed, many didn't. Uh, because it turns out the physical and anatomical data quite often agrees with the genetic data. So today we discussed phylogenetics or biological classification. And what we learned is that phylogenetics really is a pursuit of trying to understand the evolutionary relationship between species and then using that to sort of build these phylogenetic trees or cladograms, if that's your particular approach, to help understand the, the, evolutionarily, the evolutionary past of various species and how they're related to each other. I hope you learned a lot from this video and I look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thanks for coming. Bye.